We have five panelists who are going to, to present their view on the, the convergence between uh, HPC cloud. Um, so the idea is that they will present their view during an initial 10 minutes uh, slot, each of them. The order is uh, provided by on the website. So Bruno Silva from AWS, Richard Lawrence from MetOffice, Bing Sheng Yi from National University of Singapore, Alberto uh, Santi from Linux Foundation, and Valesios Baosis from ECMWF. After this initial presentation of 10 minutes, we will have a discussion during half an hour. So if you have any question, uh, we can answer one of them per talk, not more. The other question, we are going to keep them uh, at the end of the talk to feed this 30 minutes uh, discussion slot. We have already prepared some uh, questions because we have some guess about what we are going to, to address. And I just want to emphasize that uh, we have a very nice panel with a, um, industry, cloud, academics. Uh, so I think the, technically there, uh, there is a lot of uh, expectation for, from, from this talk. So our first panelist is Bruno, Bruno Silva from AWS. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, start video and start my screen share. So if you bear with me a moment. Right, can you see my presentation? Yes. Great, right, so just close this here. Right, so thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to try to stay within within the 10 minutes as much as possible. Uh, I So first, uh, there are two things I need to uh, put out of the way. First, what you're going to see uh, in these slides that I'm going to present may look like a sales pitch, but that's not the intention. The idea is to actually uh, trigger some discussion about essentially what uh, the cloud brings to uh, to HPC, to research, and uh, to, to IT in general, and how does that impact the way we need to think about how services are delivered to, to researchers and, and engineers, and et cetera. Uh, it, the other thing I need to get out of the way is in terms of technical content necessarily, there are a couple of things there, but I, I make a reference to uh, a thing called HPC Tech Shorts. There are, um, that's basically a, a set of um, YouTube videos that are being produced, produced by Brendan Buffler uh, in uh, basically from the HPC team, from the service team. And th there's a lot of content there where you can see how to do particular things uh, HPC wise and research wise. So I leave the links there on the presentation for, for you to, to look at. Uh, so a bit about myself, my name is Bruno Silva. I've um, uh, joined AWS about a year ago. Before that, I was uh, for six years at the Francis Crick Institute where I've helped set up basically their research data systems, their HPC systems, the, all the services, the team that supports them uh, from the ground up, from right from the beginning of the Institute. Um, it's an institute with about 1,200 researchers and uh, about 120 research teams with very different uh, requirements um, apart from one everything is data centric uh, so so I've, i have a lot of experience in managing data everything from be it being produced in hpc to, to be being archived etc before that i was at the university college london for five years where i've also helped set up their uh, research computing platforms right from the beginning as well um, so uh, I was uh, working on the Legion cluster and in other clusters for that period uh, uh, of time. Again, helping to set up the support team that uh, provided uh, applications and the architecture for the future clusters that we bought then afterwards. Uh, by training, I'm a physicist. So I, I graduated from UCL as well with a PhD in um, computational physics, specifically in molecular spectroscopy. Uh, and that's kind of where, where I come from. So I have that background of research and uh, in IT services. Um, so and without further ado, let's start with, with the presentation. So I won't bore you with the details about uh, what is cloud computing. So you know what cloud is, but I think the thing to highlight is that first thing about on-demand um, delivery of computing resources. So I think that's what's changed since 2006 when, when AWS or Amazon Web Services at the time, as we called, uh, were, uh, you know, set up this, this kind of idea and pioneered this, this concept is that all of a sudden there's this ability to have the resources that are available, you know, in data centers essentially through the internet uh, and, and on demand, right? So that's the, the key difference that this brought and that has tremendous implications. So a, what it brings to, to researchers in particular is the, the ability to actually 
create um, a whole auditable and reproducible stack because everything it can be treated as code essentially. So all the infrastructure, everything all the way to the application, the data management, the workflows can be encapsulated as code and becomes reproducible and auditable. Uh, because of the, the way AWS is set up, uh, we have a, a global network which allows for data to be transferred and shared globally. So collaboration is much more facilitated uh, and you know you can you can basically move the data or move the computes to where the data is within the infrastructure. Um, over time, we've developed uh, enterprise security features that allow that for data to be uh, protected. So there's the pr protection provided by the cloud, but also we have tools that help uh, users, researchers, IT managers provide the protection that's needed at the user level, at the application level as well. And we call that the shared responsibility model. So you can try new technologies at scale, um, just try it out. Bring, if you like it, great, scale it up or not, or change it, or you can try things immediately without having to wait. We also have the development of serverless technologies, so you don't have to focus on the infrastructure, you can just focus on the function and, the, and, and what you want to achieve. Um, and of course, you've got uh, a broad functionality with access to what you need. So that's the other thing that uh, Dan and, and Jakob mentioned earlier, actually, it's, it's because of the way the, the services have grown over time, uh, there's basically the AWS network that connects up a number of features, you know, things that are useful for all sorts of things. You know, we have the traditional compute storage, databases, et cetera, but you have also the machine learning services, quantum computing analytics, you know, all of those things that can be used for visualization, for example, like AR, VR, can all be brought together neatly to, to deliver a, a service for, for researchers. Uh, and I'm going to focus here today, because if we're talking about HPC is clearly the, the computed storage, but bear in mind that there's this whole other uh, ecosystem of things that can be made available to, for researchers to do their work. So on the storage side, of course, we have you know, the, the things that you're familiar with. We have block storage, shared file storage, object storage. That's probably the key innovation that came out of AWS through, uh, through S3. And all of it is, again, available to, to, to computer resources. Now, I, 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 uh, I really liked Adrian's talk earlier because he was talking about utilizing, for example, local storage um, on compute nodes to absorb I.O. at scale in a way that scales with the number of instances. And th there's, this, there's a concern, for example, around uh, you know, what happens to, 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 the, to the data that sits on, on the compute nodes. Is it ephemeral? Can we keep it, et cetera? Well, the fact that you can decouple the block storage from the instance and preserve that data actually helps with that kind of thing. Um, again, we have um, Bluster uh, through the uh, FSx service. Um, we have uh, NFS-like services essentially through uh, the Elastic File System. And of course, we have um, S3, which you know, everyone knows and, and has talked about, and we can touch on that later again. Um, on S3, the fact that we have the ability to then, uh, for example, turn that into uh, whatever. So you've put your data into, into S3, you can really push it down to deep archive, allows you to actually save a lot of costs and, and handle that, that whole life cycle of the data uh, properly. Right? So, so you put the data where it needs to be in terms of its requirements for, for access, et cetera. So again, all of that available in the same, the same infrastructure. And that's, I think, Again, one of the key features that changes everything from, from a cloud perspective of what's available is that you have all of this functionality in uh, one place. Um, again, in terms of convergence of where things are headed, naturally the cloud is looking at what um, people are doing on the ground. So for example, on, on AWS, we have um, the uh, EC2 ultra clusters as we call them, which is, are based, based around this um, compute node, uh, the, the P4D instances, they have um, uh, two Intel uh, Cascade Lake 8275CL um, uh, uh, CPUs, essentially 96 cores at three gigahertz, 1.1 terabytes of RAM, eight terabytes of NVMe local, um, and eight uh, A100 uh, GPUs with 40 gigs uh, installed, and 400 gigabytes per second, or gigabits per second, I should say, uh, EFA net networking. So if you put all this together, you, get, you have essentially something that's uh, provides a huge amount of throughput to a cluster file system and has a lot of computing capability, right? So that, that is something that we can put together on AWS and people can access that now. So it's a supercomputing class of, uh, of infrastructure. And of course we have also um, S3. Now it's funny to say S3 in the context of HPC, but the fact is, if you look at the numbers and this is on the documentation on, on the S3 website, you can get 3,500 put, copy, post, deletes 
and 5,500 get um, uh, and head requests per second per prefix on the bucket. And the other bit to remember is that there are no limits on the number of prefixes that you can have on the bucket. So this thing is can really scale. Uh, so you can, you can use it to absorb a vast amount of data and to actually push out a vast amount of data as well. So if, if you're looking at EC2 instances talking to these things, you basically max out the, the link on every instance that you put up onto it, right? So that's the, 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 the one of the benefits of using objects for, and, and you can start thinking differently about how you do the, uh, you know, how you lay out your, your data and how you perform your calculations. Uh, so going back to actually the, the topic that Adrian was talking about earlier. Uh, so open phone is actually one of the, one of the applications that are problematic in terms of the number of files that they produce, especially if you want to do lots, lots of processing of the post processing of the data, like creating uh, video uh, animations of the, you know, flow simulations or, you know, whatever, whatever you need to do in, in terms of computational fluid dynamics and modeling. So do you have these thousands of files being produced and they're all produced per core. So the more cores you have, the more files you have. So that scales naturally to be, um, you know, to, to to be producing data that should naturally sit on the node where, where it's being produced. Of course, if you're, if you're putting it on the node, you want to actually get it out as quickly as possible if it keeps producing data, right? So um, there's actually uh, this, this HPC tech short, uh, the, I'll leave the link there, where we talk about a technique where you can actually do exactly that without, without having a parallel file system, just leveraging storage that sits on the nodes and leveraging S3, you can collect those data and then if you wish, push it immediately to archive to keep it keep the costs as low as possible, and then uh, afterwards, when you want to do your post processing, retrieve it again, right? And this is essentially by doing this bit of code here, where you tar your uh, the files that are coming out of each core uh, in in the the CC2 instances and pipe that into the S3 CP command, and that pushes data really quickly. So so just to get an idea, without going into too many numbers. This is the basically the right patterns that you see. So if you, there's a service called CloudWatch that you can uh, trigger that um, essentially looks at the, uh, the the data that's on sitting on storage and then determines that if it reaches a, reaches a certain level, you can trigger a particular function. So if you call that function that I mentioned earlier, then you can start pulling data out into S3 and you can see these access patterns, these waves uh, that, that you see there. So you can start clearing data Again, without any uh, parallel file system, just uh, S3 pulling data out of the compute nodes. And then when you've done your calculation, you get rid of the compute nodes and you have the data available for post-processing analysis, right? Um, another thing that S3 enables is the fact that you can, you can store essentially and share data globally uh, within the AWS infrastructure. And we've leveraged that to provide uh, open data sets for, for people to use. So that's another thing we can do is that having these shared repositories or, or if you want to have secure data lakes, you can set that up as well. You can set, set up you know, tools that sit on top of AWS uh, that allow for data management, uh, things like iRODS, uh, talks S3 now. Uh, you could use other, other tools like Open, uh, like One Data or, um, or, or tools that accelerate, for example, S3 when, uh, when S3 is, uh, has very large data sets contained in it. So in essence, again, just to, just for the discussion, everything is code, uh, you know, reproduce and audit, collaborate globally, protect your data, et cetera. These are the themes I think that cloud brings and that affect the way we have to look at, at storage. And with that, I'll, I'll stop here and uh, look forward to the discussion later. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Bruno, thanks a lot. Uh, so just one question before moving to, to the next speaker. So talking about convergence uh, between HPC and cloud, do you observe a divergence or convergence between the size of the instances uh, between S3 and uh, the file system, parallel file system? Um, so so the, the parallel file systems still have their place, especially if the, the application, you know, if you, if you want to uh, say do parallel IO to, you know, on a file, for example, using MPI hints or whatever, um, to a very large number of instances, you know, parallel file systems still have that, that, that their place. Um, I think people will, for the nature of legacy, and especially if there's data being shared through a POSIX presentation, um, I think people will still be using parallel file systems. I think it's, it's used more um, now because people are looking to utilize the cloud more. So 
you know, you, you get sort of the traditional way of doing HPC being migrated into the cloud into the first instance. But what I'm starting to see is that people, once they've set themselves up in a traditional HPC way uh, in the cloud, the fact that you have different ways of interacting with the data, different ways of analyzing and storing the data, et cetera, and you start using S3 and in, in people start looking at the, the features and the abilities that they have with this, all this new capability and it causes them to take, take a step back and think, okay, do I actually need a scheduler to run my workload, right? Can I just, you know, bring up a bunch of instances and set them up in a way in which they talk and MPI together and then bring them down without the need of scheduling. Scheduling has the implication that you have a fixed amount of resource that you want to fit in as a mosaic, right? And, and once, you, once you're able to just bring up the, the instances that you need to do the calculation and then bring them down, kind of that need for a scheduler kind of goes away. So, so people start thinking differently about things. Um, uh, that's what I observe. So there's definitely more use of S3. There's a, a tool called Nextflow. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's used a lot in the biosciences. It relies heavily on S3 for, for analysis of data sets, et cetera. So you start seeing more and more tools going down that route rather than just sticking with the, uh, the traditional POSIX file system running run in parallel. Does that answer your question? Thank, yes, yes. I think it's a very nice answer. So our next speaker is Richard Lawrence from uh, the Met Office. Uh, Met Office, we did a bold announcement in terms of uh, convergence between cloud and HPC. So we are eager to, to hear you, uh, Richard. Um, I'll just get my screen shared. Yes, we see and we hear you. Perfect. Brilliant. So hello, my name is Richard Lawrence from the Met Office. Um, I'm an IT fellow there. Um, specialising in, in supercomputing and how we integrate our supercomputers with the rest of our, our systems. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, and it's it's probably quite suiting that I'm, I'm following from, from Bruno. We're, we're a big user of AWS. We currently send about 20 terabytes of data a day into, into S3 from, from our supercomputer um, that we then use to disseminate that data out to our customers and allow them to work within the AWS cloud on, on the data that we're producing. Um, as as um, uh, was I was just introduced, and it was said we've we've ha recently had a major announcement around um, HPC and and cloud cloud convergence. Um, we've announced a new strategic collaboration between ourselves and Microsoft, um, where we're um, procuring two generations of supercomputer and associated systems through their um, Azure platform. Um, and that's going to be for the next 10 years, we're going to be having this, this collaboration with them. So they'll be providing all of our supercomputing and HPC and um, storage in the scientific compute space um, for the next 10 years. Um, this was a big strategic investment by the, the UK government. Um, it's the largest investment there's, they've done in supercomputing. Um, it's £1.2 billion pounds, um, in total. Not all of that went to, to Microsoft, but a significant portion was for the um, supercompute and um, storage they're providing for us in that space. In order to gain that, that type of funding, we had to convince um, uh, the UK central government that we would provide an adequate return on, on that. 1.2 billion pound investment. And we worked with them to, to prove that we felt we were able to deliver about 13.7 um, billion pounds of socioeconomic benefit to the whole of the UK as part of this, um, of, of this partnership. One thing we're really proud of as part of this partnership is that Microsoft will be delivering about four and a half million pounds per year of social value to the wider UK. And that's in the region of environmental improvements and skills and training to the whole of the, the wider UK as part of this, this procurement. So we took on a new approach this time to do our, our procurement and we've gone for a fully managed service delivery model. So Microsoft will be managing both our supercomputer and all of our storage aspects as a fully um, managed service for us. Um, we've we've gone with a, a world class technology partner that are able to, to do this for us, um, and yeah, it's going to be um, highly tied into the the Microsoft Azure cloud cloud platform. Um, we didn't set out to procure a um, a cloud based supercomputer. We had a procurement that allowed um, traditional vendors and cloud hyperscalers and NVLs to to apply if they met the um, the requirements 
um, Microsoft submitted a, a solution that, um, that met, met all of those requirements and, and gave us an, a significantly interesting solution as well. So our previous approach to procuring very fast storage on our supercomputing resource was to replace it every five years or so. We then procured our, our active archive separately. And we also had another HPC that was IO focused that we procured separately as well. And then we hosted everything on, on site. And that caused us a number of issues. One is the fact that we were procuring these things separately meant their timelines didn't um, line up and they were always slightly mismatched in, in what we were buying and, and procuring. And, and we were also running into problems on our site as well. So we had to change. The main reasons we changed were um, we were running out of power on site and it was gonna require significant investment on the site to be able to cope with those um, new power requirements. We're, we've got some really old m and &E infrastructure as well, um, and that was getting towards the end of its life, and that was going to have to go for a round of significant re, um, recycling, and it wasn't going to be easy to do that whilst running two operational supercomputers on site, and along with bringing on the, the new operational supercomputers. We also feel like we're on a bit of a procurement conveyor belt and um, we're always doing procurement as soon as we bought a supercomputer and all of its storage and the archive we're on to the next one and we've constantly got people doing that and that felt a bit of a, a waste of um, some of our our best resources in, in this space we've also got a bit of a desire to move away from running infrastructure we want to do weather and climate science we're not a hpc center we don't want to be a hpc center we use hpc and storage as tools to allow us to do weather and climate so we're quite comfortable moving away and, and not having our own supercomputers that, that we're um, uh, running on our premises. So as I said, we've got a new approach. We're buying a complete managed service that's going to be our supercomputer, our archive, our IO focused HPC, doing all of the hosting, the connectivity, providing all the power. So everything as a complete managed service. It's gonna be for 10 years and two generations. It's going to increase our capacity by six times for the first generation and then at least a further three times for the, the second generation. That's both in performance and in capacity on the, the storage side as, as well. Um, we're getting a midterm refresh. So after five years, um, we'll be upgrading um, all of the capabilities within, within this managed service. So to focus in a bit on the archive and the IO focused um, HPC. So we have this active archive. Um, we currently save about 150 petabytes a day to it. Um, we're um, going to increase that by about five times um, once we get this first generation in and then that will increase again by three times. So we're looking at about 1.5 exabytes of data by 2027 and um, four exabytes of data by 2032. Um, this archive is going to be a completely cloud native archive. It's going to be written from the ground up by Microsoft. Um, we're keeping our current interface to the archive. They're duplicating that, um, that interface. Um, so our users don't have to rewrite all of their scripts. We were um, particularly pleasantly surprised by the performance that was offered um, as part of this procurement by Microsoft. They had to meet, meet our quite stringent performances for this archive. And that was both in terms of stuff that we wanted to get back pretty quickly and stuff that we had stored in deep archive currently in our, our tape systems and wanting to be able to get those back in a, in a performant manner as well. As well as that, um, they're also providing us with an IO focused HPC and that's again going to be an Azure native cloud, cloud solution, HPC solution. It's going to be using their HP series InfiniBand clusters. Um, that's got a variety of storage atta attached to it both some dedicated storage and some native um, Azure storage as, as well. Um, and we're using that for a combination of uh, capacity and, and performance reasons. We're really excited by this, this part of the, the solution. This is really gonna stretch our scientists into thinking about how they can do their science in more flexible and innovative ways. And this was a, a core part of, of Microsoft's offering to us. So really just to, um, to finish up um, where we feel um, there's going to be conversion between HPC and cloud, we absolutely do. We're, we're fully bought in. We're, we're jumping two feet into, the, into this now. Um, we think it's inevitable. Um, we, we are quite comfortable moving in, in, into this space now. And we're um, looking forward to working with our partners to help develop this and allow other people to gain confidence in, in moving this direction. So we, we absolutely do 
do believe that that cloud is is in our future. Um, one area of doubt there is we're not quite sure how cloudy it is is going to to be in in the end. We don't know whether we're ever going to move away from anything that's purely dedicated to us and in a purely um, a sense that it's going to be completely cloud native across all all of our infrastructure. But we're certainly interested and open to to that being a, a possibility and, and something we're we're looking into. So thank you very much for your time today. That's all I want to say. Okay, S thanks a lot. And uh, really your last uh, recursive slide is quite impressive. Uh, <laughs> so we need to predict the weather of the Met Office. Um, yes. There is one question uh, on the chat. Um, so you, you state at some point that um, you are a weather forecast site and not a HPC one, and you're quite happy to, to offload this complexity to the cloud. And the ACMWF uh, was mentioning at the opposite that they consider that the technical expertise of the site management is one of the key of the success. Yeah, so absolutely. any explanation between these, uh, you know, two different approaches? Um, so we're we're really happy that ECMWF are, are taking that that approach. Um, we think it's really vital that um, two of the, the world leading centres are experimenting in in this um, in this space and taking slightly different approaches, so that we can make sure that we've we've got different approaches covered. Um, we have tried going down a, a sort of a private cloud route and um, and managing our own in infrastructure. Um, we didn't feel it gave us the benefits that we we were after. Um, we feel that the in innovative nature of the hyperscalers, they're innovating at such a fast pace and in technologies that we don't necessarily see directly benefit benefiting us now, but in um, a couple of years time, they absolutely do um, pull into, into our mission and what we're doing. But um, we, yeah, we, we feel we want to concentrate much more on the, the weather and climate side and we're, we're a bit more comfortable giving up some of the stuff that um, we feel is is better served by people who are able to invest in their data centers on a, a rolling um, ability in, in and provide better solutions than we were able to do ourselves. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your answer. So let's move to our next panelist. So Bing Shen He is from the National University of Singapore. So we are eager to, to hear your, your view on the convergence between cloud and HPC. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your hey, screen. Great. Thanks. You. Um, so I, uh, thanks for the invitation. I, I want to present the topic today is uh, to uh, think that we think about the storage system for future data center from the perspective of HPC cloud. So I'm Bing Sun from NUS. So I first of all, let's review some of the trend in uh, in the memory and storage. In this figure, I show uh, actually I show you uh, the price of the storage and memory in the past uh, de a few decades. As, uh, so please pay attention. The the y-axis is actually on uh, is actually on um, on log scale. So as you can see here, the the price of the of the storage and memory actually drops significantly. As, as you can see, it's almost like uh, every year can be cut by half. Of course, nowadays, due to the COVID-19, their supply chain, there's some small fluctuation in the price, but generally the technology chain is like what we have here. Okay, so as you can see, this is really amazing. If you consider that uh, actually the day, big, we talk about big data in data centers, but actually the working set, I mean the hot data or the main working set of the data set actually doesn't grow very as fast. It may not as uh, grow as far as storage. So that's why I think if the price drops like this, we may eventually have uh, more likely to have in-memory computing or even a larger storage. The other way is that the problem is even though we have a larger storage and larger memory, but we see the late, the, the performance of the storage actually is the far behind the processors. As you can see here, I show you the bandwidth between SSD network and a DRAM bandwidth. As you can see the slopes here, actually is, um, uh, the gap between them is become wider and wider. And the other one is on latency. We, we, again, we see similar things. The latency of accessing a disk, DRAM, and actually it's far behind the uh, development of a CPU, access the da access data in the, uh, uh, the, the CPU in terms of CPU cycle, the computation cycle. 
So as you can see, when we think about these, how to put them all those trends together and also let the same thing we, we see is that the bandwidth is in, in improving as you just now, uh, uh, some of the HPC already started to use a very fast um, uh, networking interconnection. So uh, we are thinking one, how to address those challenges is like, the first thing I think uh, we, we trying to combine HPC and, and the data center is that we need to have an, a new near data processing architectures. As you just now, we can see the trend is that the data movement among the memory hierarchy or different file system and so on is very costly. So that we actually want, so we, we, we propose to move computation to the data rather than move the data around to the computation. So this really create a paradigm of near data processing. So this is really a fundamental shift from the current uh, how architectures. So we can see, uh, so recently we have seen in vendors proposed like a data uh, processing unit, DPU from NVIDIA, um, Marvell and so on. So we it really is a advocate the paradigm of hardware and software uh, co-design. And the other way is we have smart lake, a smart storage and so on. So uh, based on some programmable processor like FPGA. So in, in why we need to consider this kind of heterogeneous hardware is like, because basically because the end of MOS law and even uh, because of the end of MOS law, we are facing uh, the power and area constraint of uh, further, further, uh, further, uh, um, further performance improvement of uh, the CPU. So one thing is that we are thinking about the heterogeneous architecture, as you can see in supercomputer is already in GPU, FPGA, and ASIC in a lot of uh, different uh, cloud and uh, supercomputers. So one thing here I want, uh, in, our, in my research group, we focus on the research on FPGA. And in the past, we work on, uh, on, on GPU a lot. Uh, and now recently we are so interested in FPGA because of just now I mentioned is uh, the near data processing because FPGA becomes more powerful as you can see here. And also it has a lot of very good interconnects uh, like interface, like a network and, and store and network interface and so on. So one thing, one work in our, in our group is that we are trying to develop a so-called Sounder GP uh, system. It's basically the fast graph processing system based on FPGA. So we currently we support both in memory graph. Uh, so it's actually connected with PCIe to, uh, to, the, to the FPGA board. And also we, we support the streaming graph updates from, um, from the network. So it's really like uh, uh, processing in the while. So when the data, when the update comes in, we actually processing in the FPJ via the lateral without uh, interrupting the CPU. And, and then one, two things I want to highlight here is that, of course, I, I don't want to go into the detail of this figure, right? So, and then one thing I want to highlight is that we actually, because of graph processing is, has a lot of applications, we actually allow the users to express their application logic with high level APIs. And our optimization can actually fully utilize the, uh, the memory bandwidth of FPGA. So here is uh, some result, as you can see, we compare with the state of the art, the speed up is like uh, almost like uh, over 50% uh, to uh, 3.1 times faster. Uh, but one thing I want to highlight here is that the one here is actually the, this, this relative work is based on very low level RTL. So actually it's really t the development of this is really tedious. What we are doing here, Sounder GP is based on high level, sing, high level uh, sing, synthesis. So it's really, you can program this uh, accelerator using uh, uh, the HLS, something like a C or C++. So it's really um, a, a big improvement in terms of programmability of the accelerators. So this is really open source and also features in uh, uh, Zynix apps and libraries. You can download them. Actually it's uh, like uh, you can utilize them in the Docker, so it can be deployable in uh, in the cloud as uh, the container cloud. And also, we have been invited uh, to uh, present a tutorial in HPCA 2021 in with Sinex. Okay, so um, this is one thing. The second idea I want to present here is that so uh, as I mentioned, this 
the storage and memory price will drop, uh, actually has been dropping significantly in the past decades. I think the technology trend will continue. So the basic idea here is that how we can fit the data into memory for fast accesses. So this is very challenging. If you, have, you want to have a pure uh, DRAM solution, if you want to have pure DRAM solution, that is mostly currently uh, current supercomputer adopt. So basically we we'll form a lot of uh, DRAM for this uh, uh, solution. However, this only makes sense in, uh, in terms of scalability for terabyte or, or, um, or maybe it just does uh, uh, hundreds of terabyte this kind of scale because of the cost of the DRAM and because of energy consumption of the DRAM is very high. So uh, we need to, we have some, we need some novel and emerging solution to address this problem. So that's why we actually, we have seen the rise of uh, long volatile memory, so NVRAM. So we think this NVRAM can be the future enabler for uh, PB scale of uh, so-called in-memory processing. So, but, but actually NVRAM, although it's uh, fast, much faster than SSD and hard disk, but still we need to capture the best of the NVRAM because NVRAM is still uh, have some performance gap to the DRAM. So that's why we need to have uh, caref we need to carefully de uh, uh, design or we design the system so that can capture the best of uh, NVRAM and DRAM. So that's why in the future, in, in the uh, HPC and the cloud computing, we believe that the hybrid memory system consisting of uh, DRAM and NVRAM will be dominant in the future. So one, one piece of work we have done with, uh, with a, a, a startup company called Four Paradigm is that we actually try to uh, develop, the, uh, develop a feature database, uh, in-memory database called FEDB on, uh, on the on in-memory. So the, the key motivation of this is that in many AI application like fraud, uh, fraud detection in financial applications, so the latency is really important. And also uh, the, the customer usually require a very short uh, recover time in terms of failure. So that's why we need to have a very uh, low latency and also fast to recovery uh, uh, in memory database. So uh, that is actually, we, are, we have utilized the Intel Optum uh, DCPMM. So it, as you can see here, actually offers much larger capacity uh, than DRAM. Um, and also the price is of more affordable. And, and I think in the future, if this is going to, to be have a mass production, then the price of DCPMM can be even drop even further. So uh, in, that's why we actually have a, a machine, have a hybrid memory system, as I mentioned, have a DRAM and also as a, as a DC, DCPMM. We have proposed some uh, novel approach of how to develop data structure like a persistent uh, skip list. This is the really important uh, data structure for, for feature engineering. So uh, we, the detail I, I, want, I don't want to present here, but the basic idea is that we uh, actually need to carefully design the data structure so that it can achieve the data consistency on, uh, on the DCPMM. Eventually, our, our optimization can reduce 20% of the tail latency and actually save like almost 60% of the total ownership cost compared with the DRAM only solution. And more importantly, as you can see, we actually reduce a lot of time, like almost like two orders, two orders of magnitude in terms of recovery time, uh, thanks to the uh, persistence um, feature of the DCPMM. So this I, I, I have to conclude here. So I think I have uh, in this short presentation, I uh, present to you is that the trend of future storage. Uh, I think we have, we will see uh, like the price of the memory and storage will drop significantly as the technology trend. And also we see a lot of new, um, new HPC high performance computing near processing, near data processing uh, architectures. As we can see, NVIDIA have proposed DPU and, and also Marvell also uh, and other company also have this kind of uh, very interesting architectures. And also we, we, we're looking at smart storage with uh, or smart leveling with um, FPGA. 
And we hope that this really like, uh, we, we see this is an opportunity for, um, for academia and the industry to work together to uh, really uh, combine the HPC and the cloud computing to, um, to, to, make, uh, to make a better, uh, 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 better data processing systems. And also we see uh, because of um, the new uh, uh, memory type, like long water memory, we see the hope of uh, very large scale in memory computing uh, system uh, feasible. So uh, that's it, thanks. For more information, you can accept my homepage. Thanks a lot. And uh, also for the attendance, uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat so we can extract more information from the panelists. So I have one question for, for you. Um, so you, you mentioned the um, performance aspect of the in-memory in -memory computing. Um, the in-memory computing may have some um, deep consequences in terms of software development. Do you foresee some API evolution for the storage part? Oh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Huh? So um, I think you're asking about uh, if we shift to a memory computing. So the API application, uh, the API design will be, uh, will there be any difference, right? Am I right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so I, I, I will see this is really interesting questions. So because in traditional file system is that we are, we are facing the block device, Basically, we are working with the page, like a 4K of 16K kilobyte, this kind of granularity. But in, in, in memory computing, so actually many of those storage are byte addressable. So in terms of byte addressable, then many of the APIs like memory allocation and uh, read and write, they are also can be different. So I would say, yes, the, answer, the short answer will be yes. The API has to be redesigned for better shoot for in-memory computing. Okay, thanks. So uh, I have another question, but we will address this one in the discussion part of the, of the panel. So now we can move to our um, next speaker. Thank so you. Alberto, thanks a lot. So uh, Alberto, this is yours. So screen okay. sharing um, and so on. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, hope you can uh, hear me well. Um, yes, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for uh, uh, having invited me to this uh, very interesting workshop. Um, uh, just uh, uh, just to summarize very quickly what uh, uh, what I want to present to you here uh, uh, today. It's basically um, uh, our experience and our uh, uh, perspective, future perspective uh, uh, related to basically uh, data centric uh, application uh, management. And uh, this is just because uh, um, in uh, my, my research center where I'm currently working uh, this foundation um it's just uh, um started uh, recently uh three months ago uh to coordinate a uh, uhpc project where we have uh, to uh the, the opportunity to touch this uh, uh these topics so um just before uh going a little bit deeper with my uh my short talk uh, just a few words about me. Um, uh, I'm uh, basically a, a computer engineer. Um, I got my uh, master's degree and PhD uh, from uh, uh, Politecnico Torino in, in Italy. I was a uh, visiting researcher uh, at UPC in Spain, QDAF uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and in uh, my career, I uh, basically uh, got the ground in, uh, uh, let me say, different fields, uh, uh, more or less uh, covering uh, all, the, all the, uh, the full stack of uh, 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 computer systems. So uh, I started from digital circuit and memory testing uh, uh, design. Uh, then I moved uh, a little bit on uh, CPU microcontroller design, ma mainly related to uh, European funded projects and uh, 
And now uh, I'm mostly involved in cloud computing, high performance computing, uh, uh, and of course their convergences in, uh, within the Jan Founder project. Uh, and we, very recently we also started to look at uh, quantum computing. Um, and just mention a, a few words about me because uh, what I uh, would like to present here is uh, uh, not too much uh, far away from the, what uh, Misha uh, um, presented a few, few, few minutes uh, ago. Um, basically, uh, as I said, we started uh, uh, recently with this uh, uh, EURHPC project uh, called uh, ACROSS. Um, that uh, has the, the main focus on uh, uh, the cross stack, uh, basically cross stack uh, um, convergence. So between uh, uh, mostly HPC, uh, big data and artificial intelligence. Um, of course, uh, we are looking for this project uh, towards exascale uh, performance. Um, when, I, when we talk uh, basically about big data uh, for us is, uh, kind of uh, uh, synonymous of uh, uh, including cloud computing uh, uh, stuff inside. And uh, for this, we, we are, uh, we are uh, looking uh, at uh, how to, um, to find the best way to combine uh, HPC uh, and uh, cloud computing, uh, cloud computing um, feature uh, together. Um, the, the project is uh, uh, interesting, uh, I guess, for uh, uh, also this workshop because uh, uh, among the different objectives we uh, we stop, uh, um, we have uh, at least three pilots uh, covering different uh, uh, industrial and uh, the academic uh, use cases where we have uh, uh, this huge problem uh, related to how to combine and how to uh, how to combine HPC and cloud. And so um, the, the, the best of uh, these two different words um, and uh, how to manage uh, the, um, the, the new uh, coming uh, uh, kind of workflows that are not uh, not anymore just uh, uh, numerical simulations, but they, they need to, uh, to 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 manage different uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, computation, uh, uh, including of course um, uh, machine learning, deep learning, but also how to move and how to manage um, data flows inside uh, uh, inside these workflows. And uh, one of the uh, points that we, um, we, we noted is that uh, these kind of workflows are uh, now more uh, data-centric, uh, are more driven by data-centric data applications that are um, quite different from uh, what you, um, you have seen, uh, for sure, historically, just looking at HPC, so just, uh, uh, let's say, Pure, pure numerical simulations. Um, and they are quite uh, different just because the, the kind of uh, uh, data flows and uh, IO patterns that uh, uh, they, they manage are, uh, are different. Um, and uh, in uh, most cases, uh, uh, one of the, the, the requirements, uh, at least that we, we, uh, we gather uh, inside uh, our project, is that we need to uh, think about how to um, possibly reduce the uh, the cost of moving uh, data back and forth. Uh, just because data uh, are becoming um, bigger, uh, bigger and bigger, and uh, uh, as you as you know, uh, there is uh, uh, still even if the the technology is uh, uh, progressing. Uh, there is still a large, um, large uh, gap between uh, what uh, uh, memory elements uh, that are close to uh, the processing elements uh, can provide, and what are the, the performance uh, provided by uh, the other part of the storage stack, so uh, main memory, local disk, and so on and so forth. Um, 
and also because this uh, data scientific application uh, have uh, uh, poor, generally have uh, poor spatial and temporal localities um, that sometimes uh, fit uh, not very well with the um, the, the, the standard uh, standard um, uh, hierarchy, memory hierarchy we have uh, uh, we have so far. Um, so one in uh, our project, one of the, the things that we uh, started to put in place is to leverage on uh, uh, the work uh, provided one, by one of the, the partners, this uh, area. Um, uh, it is this, uh, uh, basically this uh, software library called uh, uh, Damaris. Um, basically the, uh, this library, uh, what, is, uh, uh, what it provides is just a, a, a way of uh, um, uh, let's say the coupling the the um, uh, the I/O part uh, that you have in your uh, the code you are uh, executing from uh, the actual uh, uh, processing of the, of your data or uh, uh, actual computation. So what they 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 did they started to did uh, uh, years ago and uh, now they uh, moved on improving this software library is to uh, think about how to uh, get inside a, a multi-core node, um, one core, one or more core, and try to um, uh, dedicate them to uh, IO operations. Um, the, the, this basic idea um, found to, to be, uh, to be uh, of work. So they already demonstrated that in the past on uh, uh, different uh, big machines, Titan, Jaguar, uh, and so on and so forth, that they could uh, get more uh, more performance uh, uh, and scaling more than uh, traditional, uh, than passing uh, just through the, the traditional uh, file system directly. Um, so what are the, the next steps that we uh, started to uh, think about inside the, the project. Um, one is to uh, still try to uh, re reduce uh, as much as possible the, the cost of uh, uh, this uh, IO and data management uh, uh, operation. And uh, uh, one of the way of doing that is uh, to, uh, instead of thinking to, um, to uh, dedicate one or more cores, you can just uh, use uh, uh, special nodes uh, called, of course, uh, bus buffers that are now uh, started to be uh, more or less common on HPC systems um, and leverage on uh, very fast storage devices to, to do this, uh, uh, this operation. But, uh, um, Actually, what we uh, recognize is that uh, there is still uh, still room, probably in the future, for uh, further extending uh, this approach. And uh, uh, in this sense, uh, um, the, also the, the talk uh, you listened before um, also touched this uh, this uh, idea that uh, um, is not actually uh, entirely new uh, with the one of processing memory. Or having in memory or near memory uh, computation. Um, what uh, uh, it makes more interesting today uh, is that this uh, we have the, um, the right pieces, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, from the technology perspective, for uh, for try to uh, really uh, leverage on this kind of uh, of concept. And uh, we also have uh, basically. Uh, also, the uh, the application that requires uh, uh, strongly requires this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, improvement. Um, just because uh, uh, processing memory is just the, the way of uh, try to move computation instead of uh, moving data uh, very close to to where data uh, data resides. And uh, um, with the uh, advancement of technologies, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, we have different uh, flavors for uh, non-volatile memories uh, with um, 
different uh, performance uh, um, uh, between uh, uh, when compared to, to each other. Um, we think that uh, in the future we could uh, uh, we could uh, uh, explore uh, and have more uh, and extract more um, performance also from the application. Uh, just leveraging on, on, on this. Um, as you said, of course, there are um, still challenges to, to this, uh, um, just because uh, uh, non-volatile uh, RAM devices, uh, uh, even if that there are uh, also in the market some, uh, ex some experimental uh, devices that uh, uh, some companies or startup try to to sell, um, it requires uh, uh, still, uh, uh, at least in my opinion, still huge, uh, uh, still huge um, effort uh, in uh, making it more uh, more flexible. Uh, when I say more flexible, I mean uh, um, since this workshop and this panel is uh, touching the convergence between HPC and cloud. One of the things that uh, we love from cloud is that uh, uh, in cloud computing, you, the user um, has a lot of abstraction of what uh, is going uh, uh, behind the, the, um, the, the system. So uh, it doesn't have to, uh, to uh, care too much about how the, the things uh, uh, have to, to set up and uh, needs to be uh, tuned, and uh, we think that one of the um, that the challenges that uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, very promising technologies uh, should uh, should uh, tackle is to how to provide uh, a, a nice software layer that can uh, abstract enough the, um, the underlying uh, complexity and try to make it more uh, more more uh, more fitting with the um, legacy, let me say, legacy uh, system we have now. So try to uh, not uh, creating uh, or not to um, uh, to to, uh, to enlarge the, the gap between uh, um, the complexity of using and moving from uh, old current machine to new new system. And of course, uh, the, the, the last point is that uh, we need also to, when we look at these new technologies, uh, uh, we need to also consider uh, not only management uh, part, so how to combine uh, also in a uh, more uh, general framework uh, ecosystem, but also security aspects that, uh, uh, that start to, to, uh, to count more. Uh, that's uh, basically all from my side. Um, open to two questions. Thanks a lot, Alberto. Uh, I, I think we are uh, running a bit out of time, so uh, we will handle the question in, in the last part. I, I would like to, to keep the stage for our last speaker from ECMWF. Um, so. Vasilios Bausis uh, from yes. ECMWF. I think I've, uh, I've started the same my screen. So. Ah, perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, uh, my name is uh, Vasilis, Vasilis Baus from ECMWF. So, and probably I hope that I keep you, uh, um, uh, my presentation is interesting to you. Well, I'm going to talk about the, the new uh, uh, European Commission uh, um, uh, program that uh, called uh, Destination Earth and the name of this project actually uh, is now is uh, said to be uh, Destiny and uh, actually I'm going to talk about what it's about the different uh, partners uh, the objectives and uh, in general the partners uh, the, the partnership I'm going to talk about the ECMWF a bit HPC and cloud community what we have been doing uh, so far Probably some uh, um, some uh, previous speakers talked about uh, ECMWF and what we do and uh, different approaches that we have uh, taken regarding HPC and cloud. And uh, finally, I'm going to talk about some uh, destination uh, destiny components 
and uh, some technical challenges because we combine uh, all these technologies, HVC, cloud and uh, storage, and in addition also a fast network uh, to, 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 the, to the whole project. So a, a little background to, about me because uh, uh, I'm not an HP, a, HPC expert. Um, my background is uh, distributed computing and uh, the last uh, eight, nine years uh, cloud computing. So, and uh, having said that, I would like to uh, say that uh, some things of uh, HPC, I, I'm aware about that, but uh, not uh, the uh, lot of uh, expertise on that. So going back to the, uh, um, the objective of uh, Destination Earth Initiative is to uh, develop a very high precision digital model uh, of the Earth uh, to monitor and simulate uh, natural and human activity in order to develop a, a, a test scenarios that uh, make available um, uh, sustainable and development of uh, and support of European environmental uh, policies. So the idea is that uh, the end users we're talking about, we, there is a categorization of the users that uh, uh, they're going to be using uh, the system. But in general, uh, we the, the project uh, the, the end users uh, could be uh, either sci scientists or uh, simply users that would like to run some kind of communication. So they can continuously monitor the health of the planet. So to study the effects of climate change, the states of the oceans, biosphere, biodiversity, land use, etc. So support the EU policy making and implementation to perform higher precision and dynamic simulation of the earth and natural systems, focus mainly on the thematic domains on marine, land and coast and atmosphere, and improve modeling of and uh, predictive uh, capa capacities so uh, to help anticipate and plan the measures in uh, a case of uh, hurricanes and other extreme weather events and natural disaster and combine the analyzing events with a major socioeconomic impact so the output would be not only forecast but also impact uh, uh, um, on different uh, areas in domain and finally to reinforce europe uh, europe's uh, industrial and uh, technological capabilities in simulation, modeling, periodic, uh, predictive uh, data analysis, artificial intelligence uh, in high computer, high, high performance computing. So the, the, the whole project is led by, by and owned by um, European Commission, strategic partnership between uh, ESA, uh, European Space Agency, ECNWF and UMASAT. So ESA is the key role of uh, system integrator and implement of the core platform. It's in RBF, we are responsible to deliver the uh, digital uh, twins uh, and also the digital uh, twins engine. I'm going to talk about uh, that later. And Umatsat is uh, responsible to uh, deliver the data lakes and the data integration. So the, the contribution agreement is probably is going to be a, a Q4 of uh, 2022. And the first phase will be starting um, right after with the operation and with a first phase of uh, 30 months to deliver the operation uh, cloud-based platform and the first uh, two digital trains. Later on, uh, the, the, the program uh, goes, uh, it's almost 10 years and at the end it's to have a full uh, digital train of the earth and uh, uh, through a convergence of multiple digital trains of the platform. So this is the, the end goal of the class. So starting a date 2021 year, actually we're heading to targeting uh, beginning of uh, next uh, decade to deliver the whole uh, functionality of the platform. So in general, this is what the, the, the different uh, partners uh, would deliver. So uh, the, the heart of the destination of the Earth would be the federated cloud-based uh, modeling simulation platform, which uh, provides access to data, advanced computing infrastructure, so HPC, software, artificial intelligence, and uh, machine learning uh, toolboxes. And actually, this uh, integrates with uh, the digital twins, so uh, which are the replicas of the various aspects of uh, Earth system, and uh, having also access to the data lake where all the data will be uh, uh, gathered. So you see the which mother is responsible for what, and uh, what is uh, which is uh, uh, there, there are some overlaps, and uh, and actually we we have a specific. Uh, uh, delivers to, to, to deliver on its uh, phase. So partnership be, besides the core, pl the core plat 
partners would, do, would have also uh, national med services, uh, science, technology services, and other infrastructures coming from various uh, uh, European uh, uh, um, uh, projects or consortia. Uh, so USBC is uh, vital for us. Uh, just a few words about the uh, ECMWF. I know that uh, most of you, you know about us, but uh, just to remind uh, what the ECMWF. So we are the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. We have uh, 34 uh, states. We are in the governmental organization. Uh, and um, we have uh, our main offices used to be only in Reading, where actually I'm connecting uh, from. And uh, soon we, we're going to have also uh, our Bologna data center would be ready by the end of uh, this year and the person uh, next year. And uh, we have also starting to move uh, some parts of our offices to, uh, to Bonn in German. So the Destination Earth uh, people would be based in um, uh, German. So we are Operation Numer uh, Numerical Weather uh, um, Prediction Center. We, it's a research and operation uh, uh, service 24-7. We have a generation daily. We generate the uh, weather forecast and we disseminate to, to our member states and uh, our customers uh, worldwide. Uh, we assimilate about six to eight million uh, observations per day and we feed that to our models. And we have also the petabytes of observations and forecast. We have a cloud infrastructure, we have HPC infrastructure, uh, which is one of the uh, largest uh, global uh, weather sites. And uh, our, our new data center is going to be even bigger by a factor of at least uh, six. Cloud infrastructure, we have uh, the three um, uh, Copernicus services running and together with uh, one of the VSS uh, called uh, Wikio. And uh, the European Weather Cloud, which is an initiative that we started with uh, UMATSAT a few years ago and uh, still is in a pilot phase and will be, become operational next year. So just to, uh, as a, um, our, the climatological data is about uh, 250 petabytes and it's growing uh, with a rate of uh, uh, 250 petabytes uh, per day. So I'm mentioning that because uh, what I'm going to uh, show you uh, later on the, the workflows and uh, and uh, and in destiny would not be uh, uh, considered different from what we do now. So we have a data simulation, we have a pre-production, we have a, a forecast uh, model run, and then we have the project gener product generation. To archive this data locally to our data handling system, we disseminate uh, uh, a lot of uh, data through internet and uh, list lines and. Uh, uh, ARMDCN, which is the regional methodological data um, network. Uh, and um, and uh, at the same time, we make available uh, to our storage that we maintain in the European Weather Cloud, which is uh, uh, based on Ceph. And uh, our cloud infrastructure is based on OpenStack or Suri. And uh, all these, uh, the member states can run their computation there and then either uh, transfer that to a public uh, service provider, cloud service provider, and uh, as a front end. And, but the backend might be also in in in, in European Weather Cloud. I'm just uh, I was uh, heavily involved in designing, implementing, and uh, delivering the European Weather Cloud and supporting the European Weather Cloud. So this is something that I had a lot of uh, informant personally. So going back to the destination Earth. So I presented the workflow before just to uh, show you uh, what we have done what we have been doing for the last, uh, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And uh, uh, probably it's gonna be more or less what we're gonna be doing also in the uh, destiny. So this is a, an outline of uh, uh, the various components, uh, what, what, what our responsibility. So we have the uh, digital trains in the middle. We have uh, at, at the left hand side, we see the acquisition of data from various uh, sources that will be stored to some kind of uh, data bridges to the data, reposit data lake repository. And then it would be after processing would be moved to the data warehouse. This part is the responsibility of uh, UMATSAT. And uh, then uh, at the right hand side is the user land. So users are going to have access to to all these data through the specify, uh, uh, specific APIs and then move uh, and run their computation. So this is an outline of the digital twin engine, which actually encapsulates all the functionality that would be needed to make available the the output, the input and output of the uh, digital twins that you see uh, in the middle of the uh, diagram. And where we run uh, the computation, we run the, our uh, models and and uh, with the aid of uh, machine learning uh, toolkits, we uh, provide uh, 
the output and uh, and impact models that actually is one of the uh, key output of the, um, the trends. So things like resource allocation, security, performance monitoring, uh, updates, configuration management, uh, workflow management would be delivered from the digital trends. Initially, there could be only two uh, digital trends, the, the ones that is in the is responsible to deliver, but uh, later on in phase two and phase three would be also more uh, uh, digital trends on the different domains. So this is the interconnection between the uh, various uh, the components. So the core platform, which is called the DESP, would be uh, the entry point for the users and uh, for all the others. We have also uh, uh, some uh, uh, interconnections would be through uh, the National Research Institutes and uh, through, uh, so, uh, sorry, uh, my mistake, National Research and Education Network, so, and the uh, backbone of uh, GIAN. And then we're gonna have also uh, at the bottom of the uh, screen, you see where the digital twin would be running and uh, where we'll be um, delivering the data through the bridges to the data lake. This uh, this one was gonna, uh, the HPC uh, would not be at uh, the ECMWF, but uh, probably it's gonna be uh, the, the resources and the infrastructure will be delivered to one of the uh, HPC centers available in Europe. So, talking about the digital twins and the, the engine, so we're talking about the uh, big data. Uh, Lifecycle management and governance is important for the um, uh, uh, data lakes, but also for the digital trends. Uh, data access and the data analytics tools and visualization is important because, we, as you can see later on, we're going to produce a lot of data. Interactive and single site, multi site uh, workloads are also important, and how we're going to tackle all this together and how we configure everything together. Uh, load balancing, we're talking about load, load balancing in a different uh, scale that we have seen in a local system, so uh, a number of systems, and we're talking about a lot of computation that needs to be uh, um, balanced. Earth observation and uh, uh, analysis and all these models, this is the core of the digital trends, and actually we have to run uh, quality and uncertainty tracing, impact models, and all these uh, things would be delivered through the HPC platform. So technologies that we're talking about, it's HPC, cloud, distributed storage. Security is essential to all the functionality because first of all, this uh, is a public, uh, uh, in the public, uh, um, this is a public uh, uh, platform that would be accessed from anyone, uh, any uh, European citizen, and I think also out of uh, Europe. And also tools, uh, there's uh, also some important that the tools and systems are maturity and their operational readiness. So we have to be aware about what is available and what is mature enough that to be used in our uh, platform. So regarding data, what we are, what we have a lot of uh, input. So we're talking about uh, millions of observations per day from different uh, places, atmosphere, satellite, meteorological data, IoT, marine, uh, climate uh, uh, data, environmental, and actually only 5% of this uh, can be currently used and with a trend to be 1%, but again, we have more condensed data uh, in information, and uh, this is the reason why we the trend is towards the 10%, 1%. So we have to do a lot of data fusion, we have to be uh, uh, introduce uh, algorithms that uh, uh, minimize the data that we're going to transfer. Quality, heterogeneity, standardization of data, and interoperability is important. Metadata management is important also, and automatic ways to labeling data so that it can be used for uh, uh, sources and can be retrieved and uh, uh, used. So semantic annotation, ontologies, and vocabularies might be also uh, uh, put in place. Security, privacy, integrity, and in general, uh, fair principles are important. So on top of that, we're talking about input data, we're about uh, the same thing apply also to the output data. And uh, the volume that uh, you're going to see later on is not ne negligible. So it uh, should be managed uh, uh, flexibly in the federated uh, data infrastructure, mainly uh, cloud environments and uh, and also HPC, and uh, we're going to be use also uh, we're going to be using also machine learning and tools to uh, optimize all these uh, things together, and also we have to maintain the data access methods and sovereignty uh, of uh, data access. So source identity and access rights should be maintained because we don't need uh, many uh, different providers are going to provide um, data, and we need to track uh, what is. Uh, who is providing what. So compute regarding HPC, we on HPC, we're gonna do the data handling resource allocation, uh, 
data handling and resource allocation. So it should be reliable uh, for and continuous and uh, peaks. Uh, we need also uh, observation handling and simulation uh, and post-processing all this uh, functionality will be performed by uh, HPC. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we were, I, talk, I mentioned about uh, different sites. Where, so we're talking about heterogeneous processor, memory, uh, and uh, internet connect hardware. So we need uh, something that is highly configured and uh, portable software, which is a challenge. Data access and data analytics tool. So we're going to produce a lot of uh, uh, data as you can see here. So, and we need to find a way that uh, the, this would be transferred to the uh, uh, data lakes and to uh, make available to the end users. So for the uh, extremes, the, the, the produce, we're going to produce about 130 and uh, 113 terabytes per day. And in order for to transfer this data to with a 100 gig uh, line, we need at least 3.1 and an average users of 80% uh, of the line is going to be a rough uh, three hours. For the same thing, we're talking about uh, 33 petabytes of uh, data. We're talking about um, we need almost a month uh, plus uh, to transfer this data. But again, all these numbers would be revised and actually we're going to come up with uh, some uh, ways to improve uh, these numbers. Another, another challenge is to transition to operations, documentation, training, all this uh, stuff. So at a glance, this is my... Uh, this my is, I yes. wonder if we are not uh, some all eating the, the small amount of time that we have for the discussion. I have two slides more and I conclude. This is a uh, summary of what are uh, okay, okay. the challenges. So core technologies, uh, I mentioned about that. So a coupling of uh, uh, cloud and HPC. So we're talking about HPC to the cloud or cloud to the HPC. So this needs to be uh, uh, defined. So uh, so we're going to be using uh, um, a lot of uh, um, uh, data uh, function, uh, infrastructure your HPC. Cloud, most of the uh, DTEs would be also uh, on the cloud, interfaces, staging, data, uh, and um, probably we're talking about the infrastructure as a service and platform as a service. And finally, distributed storage, which is something that uh, probably we, can, we have to transfer data to uh, Ceph uh, uh, infrastructure, data workflows, and continuous and on-demand uh, product, production modes. That, so we know we have to know where uh, the, the, the load of the system so that we can uh, uh, perform a good uh, load balancing. And that was the end. Sorry for, it took me more than I was expecting. So, sorry. No problem. I mean, this is very interesting and 10 minutes is very short. Yeah. So uh, the, the good thing is that the, the, um, we can start with the, the, the question for, for the panel. So if you have something that you would like to, to add to your presentation, you can use this as an opportunity. So we have not that many time to that not that much time. So uh, looking at the questions that we have sought by uh, you know this little poll that we we did uh, before this uh, session. So the first question would be uh, which storage solution will stand the test of time in a hybrid environment? Would you bet on Luster, S3, or Ceph? So who want to take this one? Uh, I'll, since no one is talking, I'll, uh, I think I'll take that one now. Um, the test of time. I think anything that that is uh, remains. So taking a step back, one of the key requirements that I see in scientific workloads is data retention for long periods of time. So I, I think anything, any storage infrastructure that will be able to hold data reliably in an accessible way without having to sort of do uh, media transitions from one system to another, etc. Anything that remains uh, constant over a long period of time will probably be the thing that wins out, not necessarily for HPC, but for long-term data retention. I think that specifically for HPC, um, the technologies will change over time. I think there are, there, there are differences in, in the way people are looking at infrastructure. And as experimentation speeds up, and you know, partly facilitated by the fact that you can just, you know, yeah, go somewhere, try it out, reconfigure the system in which whichever way you want, and then bring it down. It, it, the fact that you can do that allows you to to experiment and develop new things. And people that are 
developing new scientific codes uh, in this new world where cloud exists and you know and, and where uh, on premises is um, systems are emulating more of the cloud features they people will want to experiment more and you will see a change uh, so i think things that require fast processing performance will change over time things that require a long term retention will will begin to sort of consolidate around a particular standard that's my sort of position on that Thanks a lot. Um, anyone, any any panelists want to to add something on this one? So Which I think um, Lustre has got a long history. It's it's not going to disappear any, any, anywhere soon. Certainly in the, the HPC space. Um, I think you'd be crazy to bet against S3. It's the largest storage API going in the world at the moment, and I don't see that that changing. It's it's much more debatable about whether it's it's going to be deeply embedded within all um, types of, of HPC application, but it's certainly got a future in, in our space as well. So is it correct to state that some more you see both API uh, living together for still a bit of time? Yeah, different people will use different ones. Um, I don't think any of them are going to disappear um, quickly or, or soon. Um, they'll both have their own, own advantages. I don't think it's necessarily useful to set it as a war against one against the other. They're, they're different things for different, different purposes and both are going to have a, a, a long, good future, I think. OK, uh, any addition to, to this point? Otherwise, the next question is a bit more controversial. So let's go for it. Standardization or lack of standardization. So Swift versus S3 has shown competition to impose standardization to be quite costly for the community. Or could we improve convergence and ease of standardization? So every time you introduce a new standard, that's another thing to learn, another um, thing to pick up and choose between. Between, um, I think having um, standards such as S3 and Swift are, are good and out there and, and give people options. Um, I'd prefer them to be open standards that people can get behind and, and contribute to. Um, but yeah, um, I think um, Actually, having more standards is is not a bad thing if they're going in, in slightly different directions. It allows people choice um, and then stuff sort of bubbles up um, as to whether it becomes a, um, a widely adopted standard that, that most people will use or not. Yeah, I, I think standardization is a social phenomenon. Um, it's um, it has to do with communities. It has to do with relevance and interest uh, and usefulness. Uh, again, as perceived by a, a group of people, uh, there will be different groups of people that have different sets of requirements. So there will there will be always different um, standards that will be created to meet those needs. Um, so I, I think, um, yeah, I, I, personally, I, I don't I don't think it's it's going to be an issue for any for any standard out there. Um, or any protocol out there uh, in terms of their longevity. I mean, there are things will that will naturally because they've they no they're no longer useful that they'll peter out. But again, it's a social phenomenon, and yeah, but I don't think it's um, I don't think it's going to be an issue to be honest. Yeah, this is being said. So I I actually agree with Bruno. Actually, this is not an issue. Even though we can create a lot of standards and uh, standardization and so on, but in the end of the day. I think the application and ecosystem will say a yes or no on each standard. Some, if, if the standard doesn't represent their, uh, the ecosystem or the application specific uh, or application requirement, that standard will, will die out, right? So I, I think that is a, just a lateral phenomenon that we don't need to worry about that. Yeah. Okay, um, thanks. Oh, pardon me, please go ahead. No, um, yeah, just a few, few comments on that. I, I totally agree with the, the, the previous uh, um, uh, comments on, on that. 
uh, I think that uh, standardization uh, uh, is uh, yeah uh, kind of a, a community uh, process that uh, generally um, comes up from uh, the the needs and from uh, uh, the from uh, uh, taking these requirements and needs and find uh, uh, for, for a, at least for a user perspective uh, uh, um, a flexible uh, and easy to use. Uh, uh, solution. So sometimes, uh, uh, in my experience, uh, standards uh, arrive when uh, people recognize the uh, community recognize that uh, a specific set of technologies, or even just a technology, uh, is the, the the right uh, way of uh, uh, taking uh, some 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 problem and try to to solve it. So um, this is the, the, the I think that the the problem of blockchain. Uh, everything is uh, too much complex, even if it provides you uh, the best performance, sometimes uh, uh, tends to, to, to die. Okay, thanks. And now it's good because this is uh, opening some more to the last question of, the, of this uh, panel. So it's kind of slightly related to the notion of standardization. So do you think that heterogeneity that we are seeing nowadays is here to stay or this is just a transient state and that we are just waiting for the next uh, well-balanced processing architecture so we are like uh, expecting for the new xeon or are we going to stay with all this uh, um, ecosystem of architecture at the moment okay uh, i think that uh, uh, Heterogeneity, uh, in one sense or another, will be um, will be uh, the, the the next uh, the next uh, uh, the next step in the let's say in the evolution of the uh, of the computer system. I mean, says that uh, somehow we we already uh, we already seen that uh, this kind of uh, uh, of heterogeneity. In GPUs uh, is now recognized as uh, a, a standard de facto of, uh, to to be to, to have in uh, in the system. So probably, in my opinion, what we will see in the near future is some uh, um, some kind of uh, uh, sinusoidal uh, evolution of the thing. So we will have uh, uh, some the introduction of a lot of new type of hardware and uh, accompanying software that sometimes will, uh, will uh, naturally, let me say, uh, disappear. But uh, for some of them, uh, we will have a kind of stabilization uh, over, the, over the time. Just because uh, uh, what we re recognize in uh, our projects uh, we, we are uh, involved in is that um, up to now is not much uh, is not uh, uh, is not uh, uh, there is no any more uh, room for uh, just uh, um, let's say monolithic applications so we have uh, to 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 deal with applications and uh, workflows that are in general mixing mixing yeah. up all the thing, lot of things and uh, the the only way we up to now we know to to, to do the to to Mm, to deal with this kind of application the, in the best way, so getting the, the best performance, uh, um, having the, the, the best energy efficiency of the system is to specialize things. So my opinion is that in the near future, we will see some technologies appearing and maybe someone uh, disappearing, but in the long, uh, long haul, uh, most of them will, uh, will be there. Any further comment on this one before we leave the stage to the student uh, session? I just have one quick uh, dipping sense. So I just have one quick comment. So I, I actually uh, strong believe that heterogeneity is a very lateral um, evolution for, uh, uh, for, for our system. So in, in for, for decades, we have seen heterogeneity in, in for example, in CPU, at, at, at the beginning, we have SI, SIMD instruction and the lung and SIMD instruction. So it's already heterogeneity is there because we have 
really one size that's sort of the, or this kind of thing, uh, system design principle behind. And with cloud computing, that actually we, we, uh, we have seen a lot of uses, far more uses than uh, supercomputer itself in the decades ago. So of course this so diversified and large number of users, they create a lot of different demands. I think AWS, Amazon and cloud provider, they do see this kind of long tail uh, uh, phenomenon in the requirement. So I think heterogeneity is a very natural uh, solution for this kind of long tail uh, user scenario. Of course, in the head part, it can be standardized. Okay, so I think it's, it's like you have the head and the, but there's a long tail. So I think heterogeneity will be there in terms of hardware and software. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thanks a lot. Yes, I think it's a very nice uh, way to, to conclude this convergence when actually, yes, this long tail effect is something that maybe is not seen at the moment in HPC and it's uh, really specific from cloud and it has some deep uh, implication in terms of design. Um, so I, I have to, to, to thank uh, all, of, all of you. It was really great speeches, a bit too short to my taste, but we have to, to lay a bit of room for the young people. And now this is uh, the student uh, session.